counting down. All right, there we go. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining again for May's episode of Learn with Google. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about supporting a curious mindset with better search skills. Um, but of course, before we get started on that, um, move my cursor to there, um, and just acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today and whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land wherever it is for you. And I can see we've got people uh, in all different parts of Australia joining us today. So wherever it is for you, we honour the, the presence of the ancestors who reside in the imagination of this land. And uh, skipping across the ditch over to Steve in New Zealand. That's correct. Te mori ora in maunga whakahi and a wai tuku kiri ki te tūpuna tēnā koe. Tēnā koutou katoa. So um, I'm down here in Otatahi Christchurch today. So um, back in my my place of birth and wandering around mm. seeing all the old cool stuff and meeting some of the old excellent schools down here. So um, good everyone. Nice. Nice. Thanks for joining. Uh, for those that have not met us all, this is uh, actually I need to update this slide. We have new people on this team now, don't we? Um, so uh, th this was the Google for Education team as of last month, but we have two new people joining the team uh, as of this month. So we'll update the slide um, for next time. Neither of them are here today, so we'll wait and introduce you to them next time. Um, uh, sorry about April. <laughs> we we had all intentions of doing uh, our monthly webinar last month, um, and uh, in, in our fit of enthusiasm to get everything into the calendar, I completely overlooked the fact that it was right in the middle of the school holidays, and I didn't feel like most of you would want to give up a school holiday day. So we just we skipped April uh, straight into May. I uh, hope you don't mind. We'll catch up on that uh, later on. All right. Uh, today's agenda. We're talking about a few things. Uh, the topic today is search skills, and we will look at search skills, which is actually really fortuitous because there was some big news announced at Google I.O. last week, um, which is our big developer conference. It happens every year in California. Uh, and there was a whole lot of uh, announcements about artificial intelligence, uh, and one in particular about some plans to integrate AI and some of our generative AI stuff directly into Google Search. Uh, it's really exciting stuff, we'll, so we'll touch on that today. We'll look at some of the traditional skills of searching, um, but then also look at where the future of this is going, because I think it's it, it's pretty exciting space. And I know, Steve, you've been doing a ton of work here at Google, just like getting your head around the AI stuff. Every time there's an AI question, you seem to jump in with an answer. So hopefully you can do the same today. Yeah, um, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of half, half informed about most things, so we'll give it a go. Awesome. And then, of course, we'll do our usual what's new with Google for Education. And if there's anyone hanging around at the end, we'll ask, we'll give you a chance to ask some questions. I know Kimberly has a hard out at the end, so we can't run too much over time today. Uh, and let's get started. So um, first of all, um, I, I'll direct you to this little slide deck that, oh gosh, I've had this for ages. Um, Kimberly and I used to use this many moons ago when we were doing workshops and things. Uh, and it's just a list of 50 search skills. Uh, and you can get it get your own copy of it there at uh, bit.ly slash 50 search skills. Uh, and it's just a Google slide deck with a whole bunch of um, tips and tricks and ideas for how you can integrate search skills and just, just some of the things you should know. There's a lot of things that we assume people know about search and having worked with lots of people, students and teachers over the years, it's pretty clear that there's a lot of things that, um, you know, a lot of nuances that people have not necessarily picked up on. And that slide deck will help get you through some of them. Now, uh, I'm not going to go through 50 search skills today, but I thought we'd just touch on 10 that seem to be pretty useful and sometimes not a lot of people are aware. Um, sorry, just admit that person. So 10, uh, and perhaps uh, if Steve and Kimberly, guys, jump in at any time. Don't, don't let me do all the talking. Um, so feel free to unmute and jump in. Um, one of the things I really like, uh, one search skill that I think is useful to know is we often think that the search ignores common words. So words like are, the, um, if, at, the, like just the sort of, uh, Kimberly, what's the term for those? You're the, you're the English expert here. Um, prepositions? I was, definitely, I was definitely paying attention. Uh, um, Definitive they, or, in, or, in, or article they are. Definitive articles. Yeah. Art articles That's and right. prepositions. Yeah. Yeah. Prepositions yeah. Are show your place. So in, yeah. over, under. But I wasn't really determinist. I, I think. Yeah. 
I thought they were called joiny words. So, by jo joiny words. Yeah, that's, no, that's jo joiny, joiny words, words are conjunctions. Okay, well, all of those kind of words, all those little kind of words that, that people think aren't sort of actual words, uh, they actually do make a difference. And just to give you an example, if you were to type in the word who, W-H-O, into Google search, you'd probably get a search result that brought up the World Health Organization, um, which is probably what you'd expect. But if you were to change that to the who, it would actually give you information about the British rock band from the 1960s, the who. And if you were to type in a who, then you'd probably get information about Horton Hears A Who, which is the Dr. Seuss book. So, you know, we think of it, we think that the, the little joiny words don't actually make that much difference, but they actually do change the search quite significantly. So just be aware of that. Um, we simultaneously say to people those little words don't really count towards a search, but at the same time they do. So just, you know, try things different ways if you need to. Betcha. I was just going to say, I think that, the, well, if you if you want to group them together to the function and content words, so your nouns mm -hmm. and verbs and stuff are your content words. But I think the what's happening here is that those function words, like your prepositions, are actually changing the semantics. So, like, obviously, search is built on this whole concept of a semantic web. So everything's sort of linking in back together. Mm -hmm. And those words in um, create phrases, which are all the examples you just gave. They create phrases which are sort of known quantities that are often searched for or referenced in other texts. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's the word themselves if you just were to search the, it obviously will just give the definition of the. But if, when it's actually connected and it creates a phrase, that's when it really has its impact. And I suppose if you if we're saying that all those little joiny words and those little intermediate words don't really contribute much to the search, then a phrase like to be or not to be would basically return no results, but of course it does. So yeah, those words definitely do count. Um, this is an interesting one too, uh, when you put an asterisk in. Sometimes when you're doing a search and you don't actually know the word you're missing, uh, you can put an asterisk in and it will just substitute anything in that place. Really good if you're looking for like song lyrics or um, you know a quote for something and you sort of, you remember the quote but you can't remember the actual word, it will actually sort of turn up the missing words for you as well. Uh, so that, that can be a good tip as well. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know and the asterisk is a good good way to help you get through that. Um, when you're searching for terms that, are, that can be a bit ambiguous, uh, you can use the minus sign to, uh, uh, suppress certain results. So for example, if you typed in the word salsa, you probably get things about not just salsa dancing, but you know, salsa, what do you call it? It's uh, like the, the, the Mexican, what is it? Dip. It's a saucy, a dip, a dip, thank you. Salsa dip. So if you're looking for salsa dip recipes, but and not salsa dancing stuff, you just put salsa minus dance and you'll eliminate most of the dance results. Same with things like Java. If you're looking for Java, the computer language and not the coffee, just put minus coffee. Uh, Jaguar, the cat, you know, take out, put minus car. Um, it doesn't always eliminate everything, but it does a pretty good job of narrowing it down, uh, probably more than it would otherwise. So just uh, bear, bear that in mind when you've got those ambiguous words that have more than one meaning. Um, uh, hey, Betcha, can I interject on that as well? Um, just thinking about the fact that how much that is actually changed by your search history and if you're signed into the browser or your Chromebook when you're actually searching. So um, mm. if I were to look for salsa, I pretty much guarantee um, without actually putting a minus in front of it that I would get the dip because that would be more in line. I spent I spent half my life looking for recipes and trying to work out something that my four and six-year-old might actually eat. Um, so it's going to think that I'm looking for food-related stuff based on my search history. So it also is this whole extra layer of it, um, it's starting to understand you as a user and mm. trying to, you know, using the power of AI, return answers to questions that you're actually yet to ask. Yeah, one of the things that um, I don't... Not, not everyone kind of realizes is that when you do a search, not, not only is it just looking for the words you put in, but it takes a whole bunch of signals. Uh, it, uh, you know, what time of day it is, where, where are you located in the world, um, what your previous search history is. Like it takes a whole bunch of signals, what we call signals, and tries to give you specific results. So you could be doing the same search as the person sitting next to you and get quite different results depending on, um, you know, uh, your, your individual um, history of search. Uh, Kimberly, you so, were talking. So hang on a minute. Yeah, this is going to stop right there, Chris and Kimberly. Are oh. you telling me that we've already got AI in search? That <laughs> I, really? I am. I might be. Really? 
<laughs> did, did not someone oh no that's right we we invented ai in search didn't we okay sweet just, I mean, just clarify. a lot of things a lot of the time um kimberly you are a linguist like literally a linguist um like literally i'm not sure literally is actually i feel like that's there's a bit of an oxymoron <laughs> happening there um you want to talk about the etymology yeah well i know you like you, you studied linguistics so i thought you might um, like to talk about this one yeah, this was one of my favorite um, searches to do when you look up a word, um, because in a lot of the language related curriculums that we have, it actually looks at the origin of the word over time and its use over time. And when you actually look for a word and then look back at its etymology, you get to see some of its um, roots. But also, if you look at um, the usage over time it's such an incredible conversation starter um, with learners around words that come in and out of fashion uh, for various reasons or also words that completely change their meaning over time uh, and most of those words that i can think of off the top of my head are not appropriate for me to say in a recorded webinar unfortunately can you think, um, of, can you think of a good example i can use here so you literally type the word etymology colon and then you put the word in if you just look for the definition the etymology is often actually just with the definition as well um so if you just write any definition colon and then you put a word in um do you actually so... even need to put the colon in nowadays no you don't um i'm just trying to teach proper search skills there oh okay sorry <laughs> sorry <laughs> no, but you're right google and that's the thing you know when, when we when the internet was a new thing and we all got really sort of fussy about teaching search skills we were very particular about you know the way we phrase things and had to put the colons in the right space google search is so smart and so clever now that honestly you can put almost anything in there and it'll probably find what you need um but, chris but, just do girl just do girl girl and I just would write define girl and then see how it's got more definitions. So it actually will expand out and give you um, some of the etymology and the use over time, which comes. Hmm, are you right. scrolling? Right. Right. Clicking on the There you go. Okay. So here you go. So it's got your definitions and then it shows you like common phrases. And if you keep scrolling down, you'll actually see the some of the origin um, and use of it over time. And you can actually click in from here. Um, it's really interesting, isn't it, the way that, that see how much the word gets used over time? Yeah, there's some really interesting things, particularly around um, gender, race, some of those topics that have just changed in the way that we refer to them. So the you know, when you look at the etymology of girl, it used to be any young person. Um, and there is like, there's all these phrases you can look up, which is fascinating because literally every second, literally every second word in the, um, in the sentence now has completely evolved over time to mean something different. Um, but yeah, so if you just, if you, when you do the definition, you get a little bit of an insight into that origin, um, and the etymology through that as well. Yeah, and Kimberly's quite right. If we did just type definition space girl, like it probably would have given us. Or just simple. define girl, because nobody has the time yeah. to write those extra couple of characters of ishin. But the, the definition colon is what's called a search operator. And there are some other search operators. And the next example I was going to give you was this one here, which is um, file type. You know, and file type is, it's a super useful one that I think a lot of people like, don't use nearly enough. Um, and it, I don't know whether it works without the colon or whether it doesn't, but um, just to show you how it works, if I come into the search here and type in file type colon PDF, let's say, uh, and then do a search. Uh, I don't know, what can I search on? Um, artificial intelligence. Also. Any, any topic you like, right? Artificial. I shouldn't put the C and the V next to each other on the keyboard. Uh, there you go. Um, if you look at the results here, each one of these results is actually a PDF. So it's not pointing to a web page, it's pointing to a PDF document. So if I click on this OECD one, for example, it's going to go and load up not a web page, but a PDF. So if you're looking for a specific file type, uh, you know, if you're if you're a clever student, your teacher says, you know, make a uh, make a slides pre a slide presentation on a particular topic. You can always go in there and go file type PPTX, which is the PowerPoint file, find that, and then convert it to Google Docs, uh, Google, Google Slides. So, you know, there is uh, lots of uses for knowing a particular file type. 
that was um something that I was I was going to say the same, Chris. Like I feel like ten years ago we were talking about this file type with PowerPoints, for example, and I feel like that was like the first iteration of generative AI. You tell the kids to go and research a particular topic, and they could come to search and just search for a completely pre-made um, presentation on that, and then change the name, import it into slides, change the name, and submit it. Sort yeah. of like, yeah, that's that's version one of what we now have, what we're moving towards with uh, Gen AI integrated. But if you give if people give thought to like the sorts of data they're actually looking for, and then think about well, what would the appropriate file type be? So, for example, CSV here, comma separated value, that's typically uh, like a, almost like a spreadsheet kind of file um, of data. So, if you were looking for say information on I don't know climate change or something, and you wanted actual data rather than articles about it. Doing file type colon CSV is more likely to give you some actual data sets that you could download and maybe drop into sheets and do some analysis of. So thinking about the file type um, can be really super helpful sometimes. Um, another one that a lot of people don't realize is if you search and you use two dots. So for example, if you're looking for you know cameras between a certain price range, you can type in camera you know, $100 dot dot $200 and it'll limit the price range of those cameras for sale to that, or science fiction films, 1950.1960, and it will limit to specific ranges. Um, again, it's one of those search operators that most people I speak to don't seem to know exists, but super useful. Uh, I also, I, just, I use this a lot, so maybe you don't, but I, I'm often wondering where planes are. Um, I, I flew in from Bangkok this morning, and I took a sleeping pill on the plane, and uh, so I might still be a bit dopey. Um, we'll see. Uh, but if you just type in like a, a flight number, so I think uh, we go in here and I type in, uh, what was my flight number this morning? QF24, I think. If I just type in QF24, it'll give me the flight details of that specific flight. It'll tell me where it is in its journey, whether it's on time, what time it's expected to land. Uh, and I've found this is actually more up to date than a lot of the, actual, like if, if you go to the Qantas website, if a plane's late, often it hasn't updated yet, but this is nearly always updated straight away. So uh, flight, any, any flight number? Um, I, I was going to say the same, Chris. This is my go-to if you have a flight and before you leave the house to work out how early you need to um, leave because it will yeah. tell you before, usually before the airlines that the flight's delayed. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you are looking for information about a film or a TV show, adding the word cast of to the front of the search uh, will often give you um, uh, a really pretty result. So I'll so say cast of, I don't know, Stranger Things, right? If I do that, it will actually bring up that kind of result where it shows all the different sort of factors and a little bit about them and whatnot. Um, and if you hit the Show More button, it sort of expands that out and shows more people in that show. So, you know, if you're a, if you're a movie file and you you like looking up movie information, adding cast of is um, a nice way to sort of get more information really easily. Uh, and the last two little ones I want to go into here is um, refining an image search by colour. Uh, and I don't know, Steve or Kimberly, do you want to jump in on this one? Image or... searches are my favourite thing in the whole world. That's pretty cool. Like, um, um, yeah. This is a really good one to do with things like um, if you're writing, I mean, we now have we get generative AI that's going to make pictures for us, but if you're writing uh, in the good old days a story um, and you wanted an image of a forest that your characters are um, trekking through as part of their voyage, um, you could obviously use words like scary looking forest or something like that. But what you can also do is filter the um, image by colour and it will yep. actually, so for example, if you search for forest or woods or something like that, yep. Chris, and then right. you filter it and you filter the color for like dark, it's filtering out the top for you. It's got all the filter panels now, yep. magically. Yep. Um, it will yep. actually then give you. Like, well, I was just going to say, and again, with any search, it's not just the image search. I think it's just with regular search as well, but you have a button on the end that says tools. And when you, when you click that, it unfolds another layer of options. And with the image ones, um, it gives you, as Kimberly mentioned, it gives you the option to search by color. So you know, forests mainly, we'd expect them to be green, but let's say for some reason you wanted a purple forest, uh, if you were to choose purple, it's probably gonna filter that down and give you versions How of that. How beautiful is that? That's and then the, the, the best one ever in there that everybody should know if they don't already is the color transparent, oh, Chris, because that yeah. gives you the transparent yeah. background of an image so and if you find something that's like a like a 
a logo or a sort of a an object a, or a, a yeah. character or a, an animal a person things like so that if I, put, I put in say fish and it'll give me pictures of fish but then if i go to the tools and say i want uh, transparent fish then the ones you get back have transparent backgrounds so if you wanted to take that fish and paste it over the top and I put it in a slide deck or something, it'll have a transparent background behind it and it wouldn't get that white box. And while you're in there, Chris, um, you know, the, the bit that's fantastic to teach students about, of course, is the usage rights. You know, uh -huh. So you drop that down, use Creative Commons, it's like, there we go. Donna's just popped in there as well. Yep, same deal. Teach them how to, how to search for stuff they can use rather than just grabbing it. Yeah, that Creative Commons license thing, um, obviously it gives you a more restricted number of results because the, you're looking for something that has a, a, a non-copyright license attached to it or just a non-license or um, so you get less results and sometimes kids look at that and go oh but i didn't get as good a picture as if i just search with it off but you know the thing you try and teach them is the correct usage and sometimes you don't get as many results if you do it that way but that's just how it is you can also search by time like how how fresh an image is uh, by type of image if you need to say uh, you know clip art or a line drawing let's do clip art fish there you go that's better so that then restricts us to clip art with a transparent background which are free to use so use these filters they're really really uh, useful things and then the very last uh, tip I had in here is the reverse image search and this one's a su such a useful thing to be able to if you have a picture of something you want to know where it came from uh, you can literally upload that into here, and I'm just going to try and go back to the main page here. Uh, take out the fish thing. Let's go back to the little camera in the um, the search box here. The other one. Yeah, uh, image, images.google.com, which is actually the URL to get to, like so. You'll notice that on the search page there is actually a little uh, search by image button that you can click on, and then from there you can drag an image in there. Uh, and I don't have no idea what I've got in here, but let me just see if I've got something I can use. Um, no, I haven't really got search very skills. careful. Use picture. Use that search skills picture, Chris. Search skills picture? Oh, this one? Yeah, yeah. That's oh. an It's an innocuous picture. That's right. Steve's oh. a bit worried about what other things you might have. So. <laughs> How dare you? Um, there you go. So I've just uploaded a Google logo from there and it's found me a whole bunch of other Google logos, including the actual one that I'm using, or at least another, another version of it, but the same logo, uh, plus a whole bunch of other similar looking ones as well. I used to teach digital media to students and I had a student one time for a Photoshop task that I'd set students where they had to make a, an original piece of Photoshop work and the student handed in something that, let's just say it seemed suspicious. Uh, mm -hmm. And I did a reverse image search on it, and sure enough, she just borrowed it from another website. She had no idea that a teacher could just go back and look up an image and find out where it came from. Also, a really good skill to do, too, when you read news articles or students read news articles that seem a little dubious. You, know, you get those articles that has, purports to have a picture of something that's supposed to have happened, and very often if you search on the image, you realise that the picture was not actually what it purports to be and was not taken when they said it was taken. So. Um, very, it's a very good way of cross-referencing information. Chris, I always used to sorry, encourage if, people. It's, oh, sorry, Steve, you can go. You go. You go encourage it. Uh, I was just going to say, I encourage people to actually take an image of themselves and um, mm. do a reverse image search on it. I have heard, and I think it's only increasing in people finding that um, people are using their profile picture on different social media sites and things like that. Yeah. Um, it's a really good exercise. And then if you do search for an image of a person, um, you actually get um, one of the most fun things in the world, which is visually similar images listed. <laughs> and um, that's always so much fun. If you've never tried that, grab your um, favourite or least favourite um, colleagues uh, image and reverse image search it and then look at the visually similar images because they're <laughs> always um highly entertaining and then the other thing i was going to say and steve i hope i'm not stealing what you were going to say was that um this technology is now sort of i guess sitting the backbone behind google lens as well and so if you have an android phone or you have um the lens app on an ios device you can actually do this image search um, of anything so just take a picture of something and it'll search the web for you um, to find similar pictures or images and there's a whole lot of other stuff built into lens too we could actually spend the entire hour talking about lens yeah.
particularly but good. Actually, it, uh, it was a, it was a, that was a nice segue into what I was going to say, Kimberly. Actually, hey Chris, if you just hover over one of those images and right click for me, one of these. Yeah, do a right click. Oh, I think that's one big block of images. See where it says search images with Google? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. First, you do it. You can do a re reverse image search now via a right cl click on a Chromebook. Oh, so and this is actually saying Chrome Chrome as well. pick the area you want. Mm, yep. Interesting. And then it's going to bring up the lens search of that image. So you can do that. So it's exactly the same functionality as doing a reverse image search or using lens, as Kimberly was saying. Nice. That's a good tip. I like that. Thank you. Um, just to wrap up this part of the thing, then, there's some other search tips I'd sort of throw in. Sometimes when you're searching for things, uh, you might, depending on what you're actually trying to find out, sometimes you might need to hop out into sort of Google Maps or Street View or Google Earth or something and actually drop into that Street View and have a look around. So, you know, the question might be, you know, I don't know, just something that requires you to actually be somewhere to see what something looks like. So that's a good thing. Um, always a really good idea to cross-reference information across more than one site, especially if something sounds a bit odd or unusual or unbelievable. Like, you know, if 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 one website says it, maybe it's true. If 10 websites say it, it's probably true. So, you know, cross-reference it against a number of sites if, if you're really not sure about something. Um, I, I think most people know about the idea of wrapping text in quote marks to find an exact match. So if you're looking for song lyrics or quotations or something, if you put the quote marks around it. Uh, also really good for students who hand in work that uh, might not be their own. And uh, although, you know, you might not, might not be running it through originality reports in Google Classroom, maybe you just want to take a sentence that they've written, wrap it in quote marks and see if it exists somewhere else on the web. So that's also another good tip. Um, and, and honestly, sometimes, you know, when you're searching for something, just use whatever information you have. So if you're looking for something really specific, just put in everything you know about that thing. Um, and it, it, there's a pretty good chance you'll find what you're looking for. And sometimes you need to think about other ways of phrasing your question. So using, using a different term or a different, um, you know, especially if you're looking for something that might be existing, I don't know, in another country or another culture, like think about how they would say it there and what sort of words they'd use. So like if I was, you know, trying to find thongs in New Zealand, I'd probably need to know I need to use the word jandals, right? So things like that. So just use the local language if you if you know it, um, if you can. All right, I have a little search uh, task for you guys. I was I was hoping we'd have a few people in the, in the call today and I'm gonna give you a little task. I'm gonna give you a couple of moments to work on this one. So I was somewhere the other day traveling and uh, I took this photo of this building that I was in um, and I had that plaque on the wall. And I'm going to pose this question to you and see if you can come up with the answers. And maybe when you get the answers, pop them into the chat or just unmute and we can talk about it. Um, so I, I'm really curious to know if you can find just from that plaque, where is that building located? And there's a few clues there. And if you could tell me the name of one company that has an office in this building. And then if you could tell me what's the name of the rail station that's closest to the building and how many points are required to achieve the certification that they mentioned in this picture. If you listen to my top tip, you can jump ahead a whole pile of steps in that one. <laughs> that is it, does that actually work there? And by the way, if you want a high res version of the image, I've put a link down the bottom there, bit.ly slash search image one, um, and you can jump in there and actually just go into Google Drive and um, have a high res version of that if you want to poke around and have a closer look. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't even my, need to. Steve's I, tip did work in Meet. Did it? And, in uh, if you mm -hmm. if you also choose translate, you can see that the, what the name of the place is on the first line there as well. Mm -hmm. oh. So there's a whole bunch of tips there, isn't there? <laughs> yes, Donna. There is a lot of questions after a day of teaching, and I won't I won't make you think too deeply about it. But I just wanted to sort of throw out: this is sometimes the sort of things you're looking for with search. It's not always a straight, simple answer where it's just like one thing. Often you're looking for multiple aspects. Often you are looking for something where you don't have enough clues to really get, you know, the full answer in one go. Um, I, when I was teaching search in schools, I really like to try and give the kids search problems that involve multiple hops. So they couldn't just do one search and get an answer. They had to do one search to find the next clue, to find the next clue, to find the next clue to get the answer. And I think that teaches kids a much better um, process of search rather than just, you know, a few words in so um Jacinta it's not a thousand points unfortunately 
Ah, Steve, nice work. It is the Plonchit Station. So where is this building? I don't know, I'm just looking. <laughs> okay, I can see the maps. Let's have a little look, because I can go straight there on maps. Nice and I guess what's more book? important than getting the answers is what's the process you'd use for looking at the answers? And I think I'm hearing people talking here, there's probably a number of processes you could use. So like Steve used reverse image search. Uh, someone else on my being Kimberly suggested you could use Google Translate. Although I think Translate is only going to give you a translation of the top bit into whatever the bottom bit says there. It's the same same words. But you might be able to identify the language, uh, in which case you'd find it's Thai. And if you started to dig a little bit deeper, you'd search for Google Ventures Eco, sorry, a Park Ventures Ecoplex and discover that this is a building in Bangkok. And then if you went to Google Maps and actually found that and clicked into the building, you'd probably find uh, that the com one of the companies that's in that building is Google. This is Google's office inside in Bangkok. And then you'd probably look at the map and realize that the nearest railway station is just uh, the BTS station that runs just outside the building, and it's Plo and Chit Station. And then if you started to read about LEED Platinum Certification, which is a building uh, eco, um, like a, a, a eco-friendly building certification, you discover that this building has the highest level of eco-certification and you need 80 out of a possible 120 points, I think, to be classified as platinum. So there you go. So there's an example of some search skills. I'm going to give you one other example as well. I won't necessarily ask you to do this one, but it's interesting to talk about the process that you might use. So that's a photo. It's a photo I took. And it's always good if you're doing this sort of stuff with your kids too, don't go and grab a photo off the internet because they can reverse image search that one, right? Try and use your own photo because it may not exist quite exactly the same as on the internet. But there's a statue of a famous TV character starred in a sitcom about 1950s life located in a town that has a famous motorcycle museum. What's the character's full name? How much does the adult entry ticket to the museum cost in Australian dollars? And then what's the current temperature in this town? And all of those things are findable. And someone might even recognize the character. Anyone know who that is, by the way? It's the Bronze Fonz. It's the Bronze Fonz, hey, right? Which is, um, you know, a character from Happy Days. And it happens to be in what town? Oh, I've forgotten. <laughs> quick look. I've done a right click, found the Bronze Fonz, searched for the image, oh, found the image. And Jim says, what if you know this just because you're old? I know, Jim, that's 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 my problem. But um, the, the thing is, there's a lot of information, especially for students who wouldn't be old enough to know. <laughs> so if you if you Google TV character sitcom 1950s life, you'd probably find out it was Happy Days. And then you look at the cast list and you discover that this is probably Arthur Fonzarelli. And then you'd realise that the, it was, you can look up the, the um, Arthur Fonzarelli statue, and you find out that this is in Milwaukee, and then you look up Milwaukee Motorcycle Museum, you discover that the Harley Davidson Museum is in Milwaukee, and then you could go to the museum website and find out what the cost of a ticket is, and then you could do a conversion into Australian dollars using Google search, and then you could even go Milwaukee current weather and find out what the current temperature is. So there's a ton of stuff around search that goes beyond just a very simple one-dimensional search. And I think when you start to ask questions like that, you, you sort of get to that. So thanks for playing along. Um, the images are linked there if you wanted to use them with your own students or something or do it with your own photos. But I think this is a really good search skill process for teaching kids. Um, I want to show you this little video. Uh, and it just, I'll just preface it with um, Google does a lot of work around artificial intelligence. Uh, and we have a number of what we call models that inform the AI. Uh, this is until recently, this was our most sophisticated model. It's called PALM, which stands for the Pathways Language Model. And what I'm going to show you is a short video with um, a, 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 an AI character, which uses a technology we have called Synthesia. And Synthesia gives basically a, a fake human. And this fake human is being asked questions by a real human and then worked it out. And this uses a technique called inference chaining. In other words, it's like the, the, 
the ones I've just given you, where if you work out one clue, it leads to the next clue, which leads to the next clue. So just take a look at this. I find this fascinating. Make sure you got sound. Sound? No sound. Okay, hang on no a second. No sound really reinforces how much he gesticulates when he speaks, though. <laughs> it really does. So let me mm -hmm. uh, let me un. Is this a what? search challenge that so people have to work out what no, he's no, no, saying? No, no, it, it, no. It's not. I just wanted to show it to you, but uh, let me okay. read it. No, no. It's I thought that point. was a search challenge. The lack of sound was the challenge. Uh -huh. mm. uh, I can. I think now I've done all the uh, practically stuff, so I'm just going to share the tab. And the guy in the video, Dr. Alan Thompson, is, doesn't work for Google. He just gets um, access to stuff before everyone else. So this is a video from last year, uh, kind of mid to late 2022, this came yeah. out. And like I said, it uses a model called Palm, but and we've just last week released Palm 2, which is the updated version. The 5, 540B there is saying that this uses 540 billion parameters. You might have heard the term a large language model. That's the the the... the the thing that feeds the AI, uh, and the, usually the bigger the, the um, number of parameters, the more accurate and the more useful the AI is. 540 billion is a pretty large number. Uh, Palm 2 just went to 1.2 trillion parameters. So uh, have a look at this. Hopefully you've got sound now. Michael is at that really famous museum in France looking at its most famous painting. However, the artist who made this painting just makes Michael think of his favourite cartoon character from his childhood. What was the country of origin of the thing that the cartoon character usually holds in his hand? The most famous painting in the Louvre is the Mona Lisa. The artist who made the Mona Lisa is Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci is also the name of the main character in the cartoon Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Leonardo da Vinci is from Italy. The thing that Leonardo da Vinci usually holds in his hand is a katana. The country of origin of the katana is Japan. The answer is Japan. So that's called inference chaining, where you essentially link together a whole bunch of ideas, one from the other, to find the ultimate answer. Um, uh, I'll share these slides with everyone later, and if you'd like to follow that actual video, that's a short snippet taken from the whole video, which has a whole, it's about 10 minutes worth of asking questions of the AI. It's really, really impressive um, if you want to check it out, including the AI understanding humor and puns and jokes and being able to explain jokes, which is quite a step forward in AI. Now, speaking of AI, um, we released, uh, we've had this tool in, um, in internally for a while, but we re released it publicly last week. Uh, there's no longer a wait list to get access to it. Um, it is still in beta, so it's still learning. Um, but it's called Google Bard, and it is uh, a generative AI tool. Uh, some of you might have played with some other generative AI tools lately, um, but I really encourage you to take a look at this one. I uh, was talking to a guy the other day who was carrying on about how great he thought the other one was, and then he tried this, and he went, oh, my goodness, this is, this is way better. So I'd be really interested in your opinion and your thoughts. Um, but Bard, you can get it at bard.google.com. Uh, and it's been trained on the Palm 2 large language model. So this is the better version of what I just showed you. So there's a lot of intelligence behind it. Um, unfortunately, it's not available to under 18 users. Uh, and if you are using a Gmail account, you should be able to get access straight away. If you're using a workspace account through school, um, you might need to speak to your administrator to make sure it gets turned on. There's a setting in the admin you've got to turn on to have it available. Uh, otherwise, just play with it in your Gmail account for now um, until you get it turned on. It's really impressive, uh, and I, oh, I'm sharing a tab now, so it's hard to do. Um, Steve, you've been playing with Bard a lot. Have you got any thoughts you want to share on? Uh, yeah, look, it, 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 it's learning real quick for what I can see, and, yeah, if you're using your consumer account, um, which is obviously the best one to use at the moment because it's open for all those, um, you can do all sorts of things. Remembering, you know, you, if 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 it doesn't get the local curriculum you're in, then then point it at the local curriculum. So, can you write me a lesson plan using level five of the the curriculum here? Do a web address, bung it in, and we'll read it. Then flick you some stuff back as well. So, you can help to train the model by putting stuff in. Remembering, very very importantly, 
don't put stuff in there that you don't want available to the entire world because there was a situation where a certain computer company put a line of code in there that was their own proprietary code there was someone getting getting the ai to debug it for them that piece of their own proprietary code is now freely available inside the model and you can't wow. take it back so there are some people saying things like oh get students work and put it in there and get it to I would say that would probably be a very bad idea because you're putting people's work into a model that is being trained with the work going in. So a little tip there, when I read um, people saying, I'm putting this in there, it makes me worry a little bit. So have a think about what goes in there because what goes in is training the model. So Steve, this is uh, this is Bard, um, and I've just brought it up. Uh, is there any particular searches you think is a good uh, demonstration of Bard? Um, not, well, not I was going to suggest one. that we could ask if Donna's happy to share. Donna's put a couple of things she's been doing it today at her school. Yeah, so maybe Donna fun. would be happy to. If Donna, yeah. Donna, I'm putting you in one thousand percent, putting you on the spot, Donna. Uh, you yeah, know that's fine. So what I did was I actually wanted a differentiated reading activity for my kids around Rosa Parks because they're currently looking at people who took action. And I've got a couple of kids who are have got a really low, much lower reading lesson. So I just typed in. Um, create an article about Rosa Parks for a fourth grade student because I realize it's kind of built on American, not our New Zealand age. Um, I said limit it to around 200 words, um, write it in a conversational tone, and then I did that again but changed the level of the reading. So I got within the space of 10 minutes, I had three different things that the kids could read at three different reading levels um, and then with each one before I moved on to the next level I said um, create five open-ended questions that students could answer based on this text and so it gave them the open-ended questions and then the really awesome thing was I could copy it straight to a Google Doc I could share it straight to the kids um, and it just made it so easy to create that differentiation around what we actually wanted with some open-ended questions and i had three drafts to choose from so yeah it was really awesome so the drafts you're talking about are up here it, it, yeah. it's written what we've asked for but if you go up here to other drafts it's created some other versions of it just in case you might like a different version yeah so see there's different and ones one, there. of the, um, one of the activities one of the differentiations i actually cut and paste from two drafts and put them together to make one because oh. a bit of one was you know, kind of more suitable and a bit of the other was so i just tweaked it and yeah it's saving Excellent. time that's amazing um and it's not here but uh, uh pretty soon you'll find there's another button that will appear here which actually is a, like a, a send to gmail or send to google drive so having created oh, it in here you can go boom I send it straight that. to drive. oh you yeah, have that okay it, it, yeah it, that's still rolling out at the moment not everyone's yeah, got that I right now send yeah. it straight to a google doc which was amazing yeah. Yeah, so that's Bard. It's pretty cool. Um, and I'm just wondering if I, I want to show you another video. Have I set the sound all right or not? Yeah, I think um, just, just make a point there. You know, Donna is, has shown some excellent use there. And the power is, is how specific your prompt is. If you just go, write me a lesson on reading, it's probably not going to be great. Yeah. But as you can see, Donna has all those nice little, little tips and tricks in there to make sure you get just the right stuff back. So, um, she is fast becoming the expert in this space, um, especially in our New Zealand um, AI group that has uh, lots and lots of people in it. Let's not go there, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm just, I'm just sharing uh, again, because there's another little video I want to quickly show you as well. So we've talked a little bit about like traditional search skills. We've looked at how BARD is, and then this, what you're going to see uh, happening pretty soon is an integration of BARD into the search results itself. So not only will you get the traditional sort of you know conventional search results you, you would always get, but depending on your search query, uh, you'll start to see rolling out in the I think fairly near future, um, Bard integrated into those search results as well. And this little video that I will play for you is just uh, to give you a snapshot into what that might look like, what that will look like. Just a sec, it's loading. Uh, come on, okay, All right here we go. Talk like whoa, move fast, move slow. Catch me on a roll. Come say hello. Three, two, one, let's go. Yes. 
yes, yes. <laughs> Got this. Let's go. Is a hot dog a sandwich? And the answer is yes. No. Yes. No. <laughs> so yes, some pretty exciting things coming to search, uh, and it's all powered by uh, AI and as Steve mentioned before it just the more the more it starts to learn the smarter it gets the better the results get over time um, but it's pretty smart already hey, hey. Okay, it again okay so let's go back uh, oh don't need that slide um so uh we did announce a whole bunch of things last week uh last week or the week before at Google I/O which is, like I said, our big developer conference. Um, some of the things that we did announce that I think you'll find interesting uh, is the Help Me Write feature in Gmail and Docs. So I showed you before Bard and how you can put a prompt in that it will generate a, a response for you and said that there is a button that you'll see soon to send that off to Google Docs. Uh, coming even further beyond that is uh, directly inside Google Docs, there will be a little prompt that appears on the blank page that says Help Me Write. You'll see that in both Gmail and Docs. So if you want to write, a G write an email or a document, right there in Google Docs, it'll have the ability to generate that stuff from the AI directly. Um, some other exciting things, there's a thing called Google Maps Immersive View, which is a, just another way of looking at sort of Google Maps. It's very Google Earth-like. Um, you can simulate walks through parks and down roads and all sorts of things. Um, Google Photos Magic Editor. Uh, this is a kind of cool one. I put a link at the bottom there, which is the link to the actual blog post that outlines all this stuff. And I'd recommend if you're interested, like go and have a look at that because uh, it explains it more fully. But the Google Photos Magic Editor, uh, if you've used Google Photos, you know that it can do some smart stuff in terms of like trying to remove people in the backgrounds of images and that kind of thing. Magic Editor goes even further now and starts, it's almost like having a little Photoshop expert right in your photos. So if you want to change something, like it can fill in the backgrounds, it can move things around, it can adjust the lighting, it just does it all intelligently with AI. Uh, I did mention that our smartest model was Palm and it's now been updated to Palm 2 and it integrates with another thing called Gemini. You don't need to know what all that means, you just need to know it's really, really smart. Um, and the other thing we've learned is that um, when we start to combine the Palm 2 model with specific domains of knowledge, uh, it gets even smarter. So, for example, um, there's a version of Palm called MedPalm 2, which combines Palm smartness with a very specific medical data set. And what we're learning is that the AI, when fed a medical data set, can actually make decisions that uh, I think it was 87% as accurate as a an experienced um, medical specialist. So... You know, not one hundred percent, so I wouldn't want it operating on me. But uh, the fact that an AI can start to make, um, you know, medical uh, judgments um, is is pretty cool. Um, there's there was updates to Bard and Workspace. We talked about AI and Workspace. If you missed that, we did talk about it in our previous um, uh, Learn with Google back in May. There was a whole bunch of uh, talking there about AI and Workspace and this new generative search stuff that we just showed the video of. So lots and lots of exciting stuff. There was a ton of other stuff as well around Android and everything else. If you're into tech, just uh, it's really worth checking it out. Um, but lots and lots of AI updates. I think there, there is a great post, um, the 100 things we released at I.O., which gives you a very broad, broad understanding of all the huge amounts of things that were actually released there. Or mm. promised them. Yeah, and yeah. I'll I'll drop into the chat. I just dropped the um, AI one. I literally had that other blog post open, Steve. And then the other thing, if you're like me, um, 
I watched the 16 minute summary of IO on YouTube okay. and I watched it at 1.25 to 1.5 speed. So you can do it, you can knock it out in 10 minutes of um, getting a bit of a snapshot of all of the announcements and um, demos that they did. So I'll drop cool. those two things in the chat as well. Perfect. There is actually a 10 minute version as well. So you can you can probably see that in about six minutes. Um, you can probably, yeah, that's right. I'm not sure how much you, you keep up with that at that point, but. Uh -huh. well, I'm a very good employee, so I don't watch the abridged version. I watch the whole lot. Mm. No, nobody's watch. actually monitoring this call, Steve. <laughs> um, we have uh, six minutes left, so I want to make sure we wrap up on time. So just just some of the stuff that is new. Let's let's we've moved past the AI stuff now for uh, Lord, that AI stuff. It's all AI stuff, but um, we've moved past those announcements. Just some of the other new stuff that's come out uh, since we last spoke. Uh, practice sets. We've talked about practice sets for a while now. It is now generally available um, and you should be able to see it in your workspace service if you are on the teaching and learning or the plus edition of workspace you'll get practice so the ability to share practice sets is now within your domain so if you make one you can share it with other teachers which never used to be a thing yeah that's a big big thing um so yeah if you, you've heard us talk about practice sets on and off for quite a while now uh, i think we've done some demos of it before on the on the uh, learn with google um but uh yeah they're now generally available go and check it out if you haven't already uh some other things that are new we announced a whole bunch of new collaboration features in google sites um you, you can now see you've always been able to collaborate in google sites but you can now actually see where other people are working so if someone else is typing inside a paragraph or a, or a text box um you'll actually see that text box lights up with their color um so you're not tripping over each other um, up until now, you've just known someone else is in there, but not exactly where they're in there. Uh, so that's pretty cool. You can see their cursors and stuff when they're editing. Um, and we've also introduced a thing called site width. Um, depending on the, the width of the screen you're designing for, you might want to limit the width of the page to a certain width. And now you can do that as well and also have some say about what's in the background, whether there's a color in the background or not. So if you're a site nerd like me, um, that, those are pretty exciting uh, updates. Uh, and I've put I've linked the more information thing down the bottom there. I've linked to the official articles. Uh, the sites collaboration features that's now available for all the editions from fundamentals all the way up to plus. Um, there is a co-present option uh, in Google Slides. So if you are co-presenting with other people, you don't have to keep saying next slide, next slide, next slide. Uh, you can actually make them a co-presenter, and they also get a little button to advance the slides and stuff as well. Um, that's a really nice feature for when you are presenting with more than one presenter. And uh, this this has bugged me for a long time. Uh, when you are uh, trying to move a file in Google, that little box popped up, and you were supposed to navigate through there and try and find out exactly where to where to drop the other file. And it was a little bit fiddly. Um, we've now updated that to a much much better version of the file picker. So if you are trying to move a file from one place to the other. Um, you can now navigate your way there and see what you're doing much better than you used to be able to do. Uh, you can see the little GIF that's uh, showing there. It'll, it'll suggest some locations for you, and if you don't like the suggestions, you can um, search or navigate for wherever you want to put it. Uh, so, yeah, much better approach to that. Keep your eye open for that one. Uh, and that's really all we're going to talk about this week. Um, there, there is always there is lots more stuff that came out, but I'm just trying to pick out the you know the handful of things that I think is most of interest to teachers who are using this stuff in the classroom. Um, uh, and and so we'll wrap it up uh, and just remind you all that we do we try and do this every month, uh, notwithstanding trying to accidentally put them in school holidays. Uh, and the next one we are going to, on the 15th of June. We're going to talk about building your own app in 30 minutes. We're going to be looking at a cool tool called uh, Google App Sheet, um, which is ridiculously easy to use and turns out ridiculously good-looking apps that are fully functional and will run on your phone, whether it's Android or iOS. Um, the sort of thing you could make an app literally with kids in the, in the space of one class, uh, and it will be fully functional. So um, yeah, come and uh, come and check that out. Uh, we'll we'll try and show you how to make something cool. Uh, Kimberly or Steve, did you have anything you wanted to wrap up with? No, I think that was that was a lot. It was awesome um, and a lot of good, good skills. So yeah, do have a look at those links that um, Kimberly dropped in about IO if you want to have a look at the, the updates and all the links that are back on the slide deck, which you'll get in due course. Awesome, no worries. And I see someone has put the, was it Sharon? Was that you that put the, uh, 
the link in there for the slides for today. So that's good. If you want the slides, all the links are in the slide deck. Take that. Uh, if you want to get any of our past webinars, uh, every month when we do these, I take the recording and I upload it to our YouTube channel and put it into a playlist. So if you're looking for replays of anything, uh, you'll find it all there. And of course, if you want a certificate for having been here and given an hour of your time to your own professional development, you can go to their bit.ly slash GFE certificate, uh, fill in the form and it will generate one for you and send it straight to you. And on that note, uh, unless anyone has any questions in the last minute that we have before I know Kimberly runs off to pick up kids from school, uh, I will adjourn this meeting. If you've got a question, we'll hang around for a couple of minutes, or I will, and Steve might. Um, and uh, we'll see you next time. I'm going to stop the recorder. It's got an end. For light. Oh. My computer's just done something really weird. <laughs> okay. Recording. Stop recording. Okay. All right. So thanks for joining us, everyone. 